guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 192, featuring the second slice of my interview with the Betrayal at Crondor designer, Mr. Neil Halford. This part of the interview, we focus in on that game, zeroing in on its development, production, and the behind the scenes, behind the scenes, uh, rather, intrigues uh, that kept us from seeing a proper sequel to Betrayal at Crondor. Hopefully tomorrow you'll also see a bonus supplement episode to this where I catch up with Neil about his Thief of Dreams Kickstarter project, which is a novel based on that would-be sequel. So a lot of great stuff coming up. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Neil Halford. Well, in 1991, according to uh, my records, is when you joined uh, Dynamics and started working on one of my favorite games, uh, Betrayal at Crondor. Uh, I always thought that game, uh, one of the things I liked about it and uh, still admire about it is how well it integrates a narrative into a you know role-playing game mechanic. So I'm just wondering uh, what what led up to uh, first of all you joining Dynamics and, and uh, what exactly was your role in the game? And <laughs> I'm also curious about how it worked out with Raymond Feist. Um, well, uh, well. So what happened with that is uh, we were in the process of finishing up uh, Planet's Edge and kind of talking about the next projects. And uh, while uh, I, I kind of mentioned earlier is while um, uh, John Cutter was at New World, uh, John had actually come into New World from uh, the, the, uh, the breakup of CinemaWare, as did a number of people. We got uh, uh, John Quinn and also, um, okay, he was the lead artist on Might and Magic 3, and I'm drawing a blank on his name, Lewis Johnson, Lewis Johnson. Um, and so, uh, so, so John Cutter was there and, uh, we, uh, we got to know each other really well and became really good friends. And so he got a really great offer to go to Dynamics, uh, up in, in Eugene, Oregon. And he left and, and, um, so a few months after he left, you know, he called me up on the phone and he says, Neil, um, I've been talking to Jeff Tunnell, who head of, 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 uh, Dynamics back in the day. And he is a really big fan of this fantasy author, Raymond D. Feist. And he has, he's read one of Ray's books, Silverthorn. And he thought, he thinks this would be a really fantastic, you know, book to turn into, uh, into a game. So would you be interested in, in doing that? And I said, oh, well, uh, sure. That sounds like it'd be kind of cool. And, uh, it said, so, well, maybe we ought to talk about this and explore it a bit more. And so we kind of talked over uh, some possibilities. I hadn't read, uh, read uh, Silverthorne, and honestly, I wasn't really even familiar with Ray's books at the time. I knew the name. I'd heard of him before, but I hadn't read his books. Uh, and so uh, they said, let's fly you up to, to Eugene, and we'll do a, a, a interview, um, which actually uh, resulted in the weirdest interview I've ever had in my life. Uh, was actually. Um, I, f I flew up, I met with John, I met with other people who were going to be key members of the team, uh, but I was, uh, towards the middle of the day, I was supposed to be with Jeff Tunnell, and Jeff was tied up, can't meet with you, Neil, uh, but, but he'll come back, uh, maybe he'll be available at such and such a time. So, okay, fine, we'll go kill some time, we'll go do some other stuff, and we'll come back. And so, we, we contact later, ready to uh, go, go talk to him. No, Jeff's still tied up or whatever, but we'll, get, he'll, we'll see you right before you leave. Okay, great. About time to go. Uh, end of the day contact him again no he's not available it's like well i guess can jeff meet you at the at the airport and talk to you at the airport about things so my interview for dynamics literally takes place walking actually running through the terminal because i'm i'm about to be miss my flight and as far as new world knows i'm sick that day <laughs> uh so i'm running through the terminal at Dynamics with Jeff Chanel right next to me going through baggage claim, <laughs> you know, where your friends could still go with you through through the up to the gate. And um, so he interviews me walking through the terminal. And so finally he asks me whenever he gets to the terminal, he says, okay, you sound like you know what you're doing. Do you want the job? And I said, okay. And so it was pretty much a pretty much another one of those, okay, you know, uh, we'll call you in, uh, in a couple of days and we'll, do the deal and, and all this other stuff. So um, anyway, like I say, the most surreal, you know, interview I've ever had in my life. It was, you know, being on point, running through a, a, a airport and worried you're going to miss your flight. Um, so anyway, um, so the original concept by Jeff had been take Silverform 
and adapt it into uh, into a game. And the one thing I told John and I told Jeff at the time was, I don't really think that's a terribly as as a gamer. I don't really find that satisfying, particularly if I have already read the book. Uh, because I said if if somebody if I were going to go off and find one of my favorite authors and read one of his books, I don't necessarily think I would necessarily want to play that book. I would like to play in that universe. I would like to play with those characters, but I already know how it's going to end. Uh, so it's not very satisfying because I know what that's going to be like. Uh, so I said, so here's a proposition is I say, we find a hole somewhere in Ray's universe and we tell a story there. And so uh, Jeff said, okay, well, you know, kind of look it over and research the books and tell me what you think. So I sit down and I read all of Ray's books that were available at the time. So it's up from, from Magician all the way up to, what, Prince of the Blood, I think, at that point. And so uh, I came back to them. And I said, there's a 20-year hole between the end of Darkness of Sethanon and Prince of the Blood. There's no, we don't know what the heck happened in this 20 year period. And I said, I want to tell a story smack dab in the middle of, of that, that 20 year gap and find out what happened to the characters. And, and it said, there seems like there's a lot of kind of hanging threads that are left there. And, and um, so um, they said, we, so, uh, so they, I just kind of sold them on the idea. I said, we, we want to, to tell a new tale in Ray's universe set in this gap. Uh, and actually, there was an idea that Ray actually initially was very open to. He agreed with me as he said, let's not rehash something I've done. Let's do something new because it's a, it's a value add for his his readership. Because, you know, obviously his his end of this is he wants new readers, you know, uh, and obviously we want to be able to attract the audience. And so, again, if people say, oh, well, you'll only get to hear this new Feist story set in that that gap or whatever, uh, it's all the more reason to play the game. Uh, because it's something that, that we can't really access or see otherwise. Uh, so, so there was sort of a marketing kind of hook on that as well. Um, um, with, uh, with Betrayal at Crondor, um, we, we, uh, whenever I first got to, to Dynamics, uh, John Cutter and I locked ourselves literally in his office for two weeks uh, and we're there basically from start of day until usually about 10 or 11 at night, bashing through what we think would be a, a great story to tell in, in Ray's universe. Um, and so Ray's involvement was primarily send him draft of whatever we'd done. He kind of go through it and say, you know, might say, Fred, you know, would never say this. And, and you know, uh, this is actually 100 years before or I'm doing X in my next book. Uh, but by and large, he didn't really mess with it much. He was really busy at the time writing King's Buccaneer. And the funny thing at the time, too, was is that Ray admitted later is that he didn't really honestly think we were going to do what we did. He thought we would, like, make some game. There'd be some character running around named Pug, and there'd be another one running around named James, and they'd be killing pigs, and it wouldn't really be his universe. You know, only or will be his universe only in the most ridiculously vague sort of way. And of course, I'm a fanboy from way, way back. You know, I was a Trekkie as a kid. And I remembered an experience one time whenever I, early on, uh, whenever Pocket was doing the novelizations, this is sort of in the Von de McIntyre Star Trek the Motion Picture novelization period. Uh, and I read, I can't even remember the name of it. Uh, but there was a Star Trek novelization, and I was completely outraged when I read this novelization because they, whoever the author was, referred to their weapons as ray guns, uh, um, and there was any number of stuff that a hardcore Trekkie is going to say, that's not right. That's not, you know, have you ever even seen an episode of Star Trek? And there's plenty of stuff in there that was just so outrageously wrong. Um, and I, I never forgot how that felt. And so whenever I started reading those books, 
though I wasn't necessarily a big, you know, Feist fan, I didn't know him uh, like uh, like a, a, a big chunk of his fans, and actually a, a number of other people who had the company who were huge uh, Feist fans. I kind of came into into this total as a total novice. I didn't, I wasn't aware of him, so. I had to come in, in this from the angle of this is not some author I'm some deeply, deeply passionate about. I had to, I went into it like a science experiment, and saying I get to know this guy like a profile. I read the books, I read through the books, and it's not only absorbing absorbing the stories and the background and the information, but it's also picking up the way Ray creates a story, picking up the way that he his characters speak, uh, his writing style. Uh, I, I went through and said, by the time I'm done with this little experiment, I have to be Ray Feist. Um, and so the the biggest compliment that I've ever had, uh, I guess, in my career is that any number of people to this day who have not read interviews or, or whatever still think Ray wrote that story. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so, I, which again is, is fantastic. I did my job. I was supposed to tell a story set in Ray's universe. And, and, but again, Ray's, Ray's, in, uh, interface with us early on in that particular project, very early on, we had meetings where I asked him a lot of questions, you know, where I said, okay, here's a list of stuff, blah, 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 blah. I read this book and this seems to conflict what it said in this book. Okay, what's your resolution for what's what goes on? Is this true? Does this work this way? Blah 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 blah. Uh, but pretty much after that, for the for the rest of the duration of the project, I was pretty much on autopilot. There was a story that that John and I had written together, the the, the big framework of what was going to happen, and then he set me, they set me loose, and everything else was me. Uh and so um um and like I said, it was it was nerve wracking at times because you go, this is a New York Times bestselling author. This guy has a very established fan base of people. If I do anything wrong, they will let me know. They will let me know in uncertain terms whether they're happy and they're sad and everything else. Um, and at the end of the day, too, I wanted Ray to be happy with it because again, I wanted him to, to at least see that somebody had treated his universe with care and that I was paying attention. And uh, uh, so. Uh, it was kind of funny is is that after we got done and he said there was a, a moment at a German uh, toy show, which was the first time that Ray actually ever got his hands on the game to play it. Uh, it was right before we launched and Ray was playing it and he got sucked into it. He just said, I can't stop playing this. And, you know, uh, and he, he came back, and he told me, he said, there are a couple of things that you're a little off on, but there are several, but he says, for the most part, you're exactly right. He said, he said, you got Jimmy the Hand cold. He said, whenever Jimmy the Hand talks, he says, you nailed Jimmy the Hand. And uh, I felt really good about, about that because obviously he was one of the main characters we travel with and, and everything else. And in a lot of respects, one of the most defined characters because Gorath and, and Owen were my creations as were several other characters. Uh, he hadn't expected me throw, creating uh, Jimmy's twin brother. Uh, that was a curveball <laughs> for him. Um, and so, uh, so he had to go back and, and, uh, retroactively kind of create, you know, that put the, the it's kind of funny because in all the later books he wrote about the later stuff, it's weird seeing how he took my characters and then respun them later on into the later books. So there was Abbott and Cat and, and all of those other characters that kind of evolved in his later books. So that was a weird experience for me watching him interpret me, interpret them. Uh, so... Um, yeah, I was going to mention, after I played Betrayal of Crondor, I found the uh, Feist novelization of the game and read that. Yeah. So that was just weird and surreal because, you know, uh, it, it's just weird to see, here's a novel based on something I wrote, based on something Ray wrote, which was based on a role-playing game that he used to play with his friends. Um, so it's just weird, this, this cycle of, it was a book, it was a game, it's a book, it's a game, it's a book. It's a game, it's a book. Uh, so, anyway. Well, after that, you were working on a sequel to it, right, called Thief of Dreams. And somehow this, uh, I never have quite understood how this ended up becoming a betrayal in Antara. Uh, can you, what can you tell me of that, of that phase? Okay, uh, so, so let me first, I'm very clear, is Thief of Dreams and betrayal at Antara totally different things. I had nothing to do with it, and Thief was not, uh, Antara was not Thief. Uh, and, and neither was Return. 
the uh, because so here is the dealio is that after we got done with betrayal um our parent company at the time of course we were working for dynamics but our parent company was sierra online and john cutter and i had of course done a lot of research looking at the way these games the role-playing games are the way they sell and all this other stuff because again we we wanted to make sure that it's it that it was handled properly and so the sales dynamic at the time for an adventure game was you release the game on release day, five billion copies, you know, sells like mad for three months and falls off the chart. And that's what they were used to. And we say role playing games don't sell that way. We say role playing games, they'll have a spike on launch, it'll fall down a little bit, then it levels off and it sells steadily for three years. You know, role-playing games are a different set of folks because particularly if you make something that's really addictive, you get your hooks into them, they'll keep on playing it and playing it and playing it and playing it, talking around it or passing around to their friends. So the RPG genre is very word-of-mouth driven, uh, much more so than the adventure market. The adventure market is, it when is there an advertising splash? You know, um, and so we kind of told them, you know, off the, off the bat, I said, do not expect that this is going to sell the way King's Quest did. Do not expect it to sell like a, a lot of the other titles it used to be. It has a different sales dynamic. So they said, okay. So Crowder comes out and does exactly what we told them. Spikes, falls off. Well, they see the fall off. Said, oh, it's a failure. And firing all of you. And, uh, well, actually, actually before, that, before, the, before the firing all, all of you, is that we were starting to work on a sequel and they're still watching the numbers and it's starting to have that 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 decline and so we're working on thief and honestly to this day it is one of my great sadnesses that the world never got to see thief uh, I, I will do the only thing I'll say of it at the moment is the fact is that when Ray read my outline for it he says Neil if you don't do this as a game I'm doing it as a book uh, <laughs> um, and so, I mean, he liked it that much, uh, and, uh, because at least I'd had that, you know, I'd had the advantage of, it's, it'd been, I had the, the two years of simmering in Feist's universe, and I, and by this point, I knew him pretty cold, and not only that is, I had read the, the Kelowan books that he'd written with Ray, Ray Feist, and actually the first proposal I had was, second game was going to be set in Kelowan. Uh, I really wanted to do an adventure over there. Uh, but the only problem was is that this would have meant acquiring a second license because even though Ray was co-author of that universe and he created Kelowan for uh, Magician, all of the additional material that he had co-created with Janney Wirtz uh, was also tied up with her license. And they said, well, you know, we don't want to mess around with acquiring another, uh, another license. And as it is, Condor was over budget. We don't know how the first one did. And we don't want to we don't want to do that. So go back to the drawing board. So do another one. So uh, I went back and created another concept that actually kind of went back uh, that dealt with a lot of the kind of back history materials that actually always have kind of existed for Ray's universe, uh, because uh, those people who aren't necessarily hardcore uh, Feist fans don't understand or realize is that his universe actually came from a role-playing universe that his buddies had here in San Diego. Uh, and they actually had created the, the world of Mechemia and, um, and Ray's stuff was actually all taking out in the, the uh, that there was this little duchy of Cry D that Ray had kind of created out there. And he started basically, he asked the kind of the club, said, hey guys, can I you know, use this thing over here and this thing over there? And that story actually takes place like 3,000 years or something uh, after the world of, was after or before, I can't remember, uh, uh, that takes place in the books. And so um, I had gone back and looked at a lot, a lot of those materials, and I said, I really like some of the aspects of the story you have here. I really want to, to take this idea and expand on this, because I think this is really fascinating and make a really fascinating story. And so anyway, Ray loved it, and uh, I, I, I really was excited to work on that particular title because I, again, there's a lot of stuff that, that I said, you know, I think we can improve on, we can do better, we can improve the system, we can tell a better story. Um, and so we were excited about it. And then they came back and said, yep, it's not selling the way we expected to. So we're laying off the entire team, fired John and sent him off. They took my programmers, they gave them to other teams. And so there was a period uh, for about another two or three months 
in which I was sitting alone in this corner of because dynamics was broken up and there were different wings. And there was one wing that was the Crondor wing. And so at one point, I was the only person left in the entire wing of the building, all alone, uh, back there in my office, going mad because I don't know what their plans are for me. They've gotten rid of everything. And then finally, at one point, um, then this crazy thing happened is that they put it on CD-ROM. Uh, and suddenly it went boing, and it went up, and it went up, and it went up, and it went, it just went orbital once it went on CD-ROM. Um, and so, uh, and there are a couple of reasons for that. Is number one, part of our spike was because we were one of the first games available on, on CD-ROM. You know, there wasn't a lot of games that were available on CD. And so they, so a lot of people got to hear, oh, wow, I get to hear the, the orchestrated version of, of Jan's, you know, soundtrack rather than my little uh, MIDI 32, you know, beep, 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 you know, beep, 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 beep. Um, so, uh, so there's, that was partially a factor to it, but also to, it got a new attention whenever the, the, the CD went up, but it, it made just crazy amounts of money. And one of the great satisfactions that I have is that, um, Cronder actually ended up making, it was actually one of their top making money making titles that Dynamics ever made. Uh, um, so Asia Pacific, I mean, it was right up there with some of their classic titles. Um, and so, uh, but my team's gone. I have no team. And so they come back to me and said, Neil, how would you like to do this by yourself? You know, we, you know, John's already gone. He's already working at the company. And I was terrified because I mean, I'm still relatively still a kid and we have this huge title now and they say we want you to run it all by yourself you build a new team and all this other stuff and they said here's the budget that we'll give you to do it and i'm looking at it and so i i managed to get a hold of the the, the budget and everything else from cron uh, from Be uh, betrayal so i lay it down and i lay down the proposed one and i'm going over i'm going over looking at the two of them and and i spend about five or six hours looking at the two of them and then i said okay I really don't know what I'm doing, uh, but I'm pretty sure, you know, that because the, the new budget they've handed me is roughly a third of the total budget that we had on Crondor. And they said, not only when we want to spend a third, you know, so that we're so we're, we're down to a third of the budget of the original and we want you to do it in about half the time. Why? Why did they do that? Um, and so, well, it was just. You know, it's the same thing is, is that other companies is they're trying to make a profit. And so we want to cut overhead. And so said, maybe we can reuse assets and blah, 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 blah. blah. And so, yeah, to a certain degree. Yeah, we've already painted Crondor. We can still use the Crondor background. Uh, it says, but people are not going to want to go back and say, you know, and then next Tuesday in Crondor, uh, you know, and play, replay exactly the same game they played before. You know, we've, we said we have an obligation as a sequel. We need to be bigger, better, you know, what have you, and grow on the original title, not make something smaller. At the very least, give us three quarters of the original title and maybe something I could do. But I, anyway, I took the books and I took them to Pat Cook, who was uh, on uh, several of their other games. He was actually in charge of all their sports games. And Pat was very experienced. And I said, Pat, Take a look at these games. I said, I'm, I'm not as experienced as, as you are. Uh, take a look at these and just look them uh, look them over and tell me if I'm insane. Is it possible to do what th what I'm, I've been tasked to do uh, with the budget they handed me? And so Pat said, okay, I'll find you. I'll, I'll, I'll do that for you. So I come back the next day and I, I, I walk into Pat's office and he's just shaking his head. He says, Neil, I'm sorry. He said, you know, if they handed me the same circumstances, I couldn't do it either. And I'm a, I'm a lot more experienced experience than you are. I've, I've, I know how to do this. I, said, I couldn't do it with this budget. And I said, okay, so I'm not crazy. I feel, feel much better. And so, so I go to Tony Renicky, who's, who's in charge of dynamics. I said, you know, uh, uh, and I, I sent him a, an email or a note or I put a note on his desk or whatever and said, Tony, I can't do it for this, this title uh, for, for whatever. Um, but um, uh, I'm, I, I'm sorry, but I need to either have a bigger budget or we need to figure out how we can do this because I said, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to be able to do it for this. So meanwhile, there's a big meeting for the day. This is the dynamics uh, company meeting. You know, they have, you know, their quarterly meeting where they get all the employees together. And let's tell everybody what's going on. So quarterly meeting, we go through blah, blah, blah. 
the trailer of Condor does did fantastically. Blah, 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 blah. Just going, yeah, thanks for firing all of my team. Uh, and they said, and so Neil Holford has decided to lead the sequel. What? <laughs> and I'm sitting in the background. I'm just going, did you not read my letter? Did you, what? Uh, and, and of course, and I'm just smiling in the standing. And then everything's over. Less like I'm going, what? So I go back up to Rene, uh, Tony's office and I told him and, and I said, you know, and he said, oh, well, you know, I, I don't think I got around to reading your, your letter and I'm so sorry and blah, blah, blah. And so he said, don't worry about it. We've got something else for you to do. Okay, like, and he said, no, no, don't worry. He says, we've got something. It's perfect for you. Don't worry about it. And I said, is there anything I need to be doing? Is it, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm collecting a paycheck and not doing anything. And he says, don't worry about it, we'll, we'll call. And so, so, you know, just don't worry about it, we'll come to you. So I'm literally, I've got whiteboards on all three walls of my, my office. And I am in there every morning just writing down every game design idea I have. It looks like I've gone completely bonkers, you know, uh, just because I'm paranoid. And one day I'm calling up Ray uh, just because I was kind of asking him about what was going on with the Condor license. Um, and he said, oh, well, Neil, I can tell you what, what's, what's going on. You know, uh, they're not telling you, I guess, but, uh, yeah, they bought Rendezvous with Rama. And, uh, and I said, what? <laughs> the chance to do Arthur C. Clarke? Are you kidding me? Um, and so, uh, and, and Ray, Ray had already kind of bought his rights back for, for Crondor. And uh, he was going to go, go play with somebody else. And so, uh, Ultimately, so so I didn't hear that that uh, uh, the negotiations for Rama had turned out that well Sierra Online decided they wanted to keep it for themselves and not for their little you know off studio, uh, and so and I think they might have been a little bit mad that that actually Crondor they, that uh, in the, in the the awards the ceremonies for Crondor we actually beat their uh, reigning RPG. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, we've won most of the awards they typically won that year. Um, so there might have been a little bit of annoyance there. I don't know. But um, anyway, uh, so uh, the long and short of it was is that Crondor was dead there. They actually offered me, like I said, a, a, a sports title. And I go, I have no idea what I would do with a sports title. I said, it's just complete waste uh, to throw a sports title to me. And Unless you let me put the living dead in, in the game or, or something else like that, uh, I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm I have to go. Um, thank you so much. I've appreciated everything that you've done for me, but but no. So uh, I left. Uh, I left uh, Dynamics. So the ultimate decision came down and said, "Well, you know, we didn't make nearly enough money off of this whole betrayal cow." Unfortunately, the license, Ray is taking his license back because basically they got rid of John and then, you know, me too. Uh, and so they don't have Neil, they don't have John. So I'm taking my, my toys and I'm going home. Uh, so uh, they decided, well, we'll just take Betrayal at Crondor's engine and we'll just put another team together. Uh, and presumably they did exactly what I thought is they took a third of the budget and they took the, a, a brand new team, took our tech and put together the trail at, Cron, uh, at Antara. And so um, as for what happened there and everything else, I wasn't involved. I wasn't there. And, uh, uh, you know, I'll be honest, you know, I, I heard about it and I was just so disgusted with the whole situation. I didn't even play it. I just said, I can't. Uh, I, I, I was I just salty earth. I'm 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 off to bigger and better things. So um, a few months uh, passed by, and then I heard from Ray Feist, and he said we have the license for Crondor, and I've sold them to another company that's down in Los Angeles, uh, to a company uh, called uh, Seventh Level, and uh, we're and so then started a whole kind of situation with talking with them, doing work, uh, some work with the guys down at seventh level. Um, and that was a totally different, different circumstance. And again, um, some very smart guys there, some very savvy guys, uh, uh, primarily people who had worked in Hollywood. They weren't, there wasn't really a stable full of game developers there at seventh level. And so uh, the hard part for us was uh, we, uh, 
we were talking about the game and, and deciding what we wanted to do with Return. And uh, they're saying, yeah, we'll have the game done in 10 months. And I'm going, you will not have the game done in 10 months. And I said, you don't have an engine. You know, he said, you've done some puzzle games. Uh, but those puzzle games, he says, so you've done the Monty Python you know, game or, or whatever you've done. He says, but that's not a, uh, that's not a 3D you know, a 3D mo a engine. It won't do what you want it to do. You cannot replicate what we did with Betrayal in 10 months. Oh, we've got a lot of really smart guys and they've got a lot of experience and blah, 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 blah. Says, yes, lots of experience and none of which applies to this. I'm not trying to be, tell you guys are stupid, but you're not going to do it in 10 months. Uh, and I said, you'll be lucky to do it in 18. Uh, because I said, what, you know, with Betrayal, we actually had a huge head start because what they did is they took the Aces of the Pacific engine and put it on the ground. That's what Betrayal of Crondor started off being. It's the Aces of the Pacific engine with terrain uh, that you can move around on. And then, of course, obviously they had to heavily modify it after that, but they started with a huge, you know, leap that they already had this, this 3D engine up and running to, to begin with. And so we had a lot of disagreements about reality. Um, uh, <laughs> with uh, with that and ultimately i said i said look you guys are smart guys you're you're talented but it's just not going to work you know uh and at the time i was actually kind of doing long distance consulting they had one office in in dallas texas and they had an office in la and i was at the time living back in oklahoma for a while my dad has uh had had uh, uh lymphatic cancer you know barely beat it uh, and, um, uh, so I, I really determined I wanted to spend some time with my dad because I honestly didn't know at that point how long I was going to have. And as fate turned out, I didn't have much uh, uh, longer with him, but he didn't die from, from cancer. He died of a heart attack just out of the blue, but, but I'm, I'm really glad that I spent that time back in Oklahoma. But, so I was having to kind of do the stuff long distance from both, uh, for the, the title. I just said, it's not worth the aggravation. And I, I, you know, Telling me that if I just believe in sunshine and rainbows, you know, uh, and, and the power of imagination ain't going to make it happen. Uh, and so I ultimately decided to kind of sever that tie. But there are still a lot of of my touches in the game. The presence of the crawler, the Ashara was my character, and there's some other stuff that's in there. But um, obviously Ray and that other team uh, went, went to uh, sort of their own places with it. And so it is sort of a sequel to to Betrayal, but I've never really considered it the sequel. The, the, the real sequel to that game still has never been made. Um, so uh, who knows? One of these days, if Ray's license ever gets untied up again, uh, I will put a sequel to it. Unless it's a Kickstarter, perhaps, and you're... Yeah, maybe a Kickstarter out there, but we like to say, first, first like to say, Ray's, I've, 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 you know, of course, this coming year, you know, this or this this year is the 20th anniversary of the release. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, I've over the past few years, I've talked a lot to to my guys about said, hey, you know, what would you what would you think about like coming back out of the woodwork and make a sequel to, to Betrayal? Uh, and of course, I talked to Rafe about it first, because obviously, uh, you know, we can't play unless Ray decides that he says it's OK. And Ray said, well. The well, problem is, is my my license is actually tied up for the time being for I mean, with unspecified entity, which I can't talk about. Uh, um, but it's 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 uh, tied up, and so we can't do uh, anything with his Crondor universe anytime soon. Um, we have chatted about doing a spiritual sequel to the game. Uh, of course, a lot of people say, "What the hell does that mean?" And I said, "Well, your guess is as, good as mine." Um, uh, but I will say is that if you will trust the fact that that. At the end of the day, I was actually the guy who wrote the story for The Trail of Crondor. If you have any question about that, read the beginning of Ray Feist's novelization, and it says exactly that. Uh, um, uh, and so I was the guy that wrote the story for, the, for, for that game. Uh, John and I would, would build the engine for that. Uh, there would be a lot of the, the, the stuff. It would probably be a turn-based combat uh, the way that we had. It would be probably more sophisticated than the, than the turn-based we had. It was very chess like in the game. I would probably want to go for something that was almost like a hybrid between that and I really loved some of the, the stop time combat that they had in Baldur's Gate. Uh, and, and do something like that where you get to make strategic choices, but then you can watch all the mayhem happen, you know? Uh, and you can decide, okay, stop, and I want to make another choice. And so 
you have some of that element where you get to make choices. Uh, but if you if you choose to want to play it just like real time, fine, go ahead. You you can do that all day long, or you can stop it and make strategic choices and alter alter what's going on. And so I really love that aspect of things because it allows you to say, what kind of player are you? Well, I'm more actional RPG oriented. Fine, play it that way. You know, I want I want to make more strategic choices. Fine, great, you can play it this way. So um, uh, the puzzle chests would come back. Those were enormously popular. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many times we got letters from people talking about those freaking puzzle chests. Um, so those would be back. Um, but um, again, it's one of those things that the, the downside of, of that particular idea is, is that most of the team are either full time with other companies or what have you. We have no budget. Um, and people have said, well, Neil, you should just start a Kickstarter and go do this thing right now. And I think we were we would run into the same situation that we had with, you know, um, a few of you who, who follow me kind of know about uh, Thorvala and sort of what happened with Thorvala. And, uh, and they're kind of talking, well, there's Thorvala and then there's Wildman. And I said, there's very different kind of circumstances between the two is that Thorvala, there wasn't an existing team. There wasn't an existing you know, game company that was established. We have all of these resources and assets and all this other stuff there to begin with. Uh, and so really there was a Kickstarter basis to, to start a company, uh, which is a much har a higher bar to begin with uh, than say what, what's going on with GPG because JP GPG is, We've made several games. We have these people in place. We have these assets are, that are there in current. We have games that you've recently heard of. Uh, all these things to begin with. Uh, and I, I have, you know, as much as, as people love Betrayal at Crondor uh, and Dungeon Siege and some other titles that I've worked on, uh, I'm not necessarily, I'm not a household player. I'm, I, I don't have the cachet that, that John Romero has. I don't have, you know, uh, my, I don't have the kind of name recognition. And that's fine. Uh, but I try to be realistic about it is that if I were to kickstart a company or, you know, basically kickstart that sequel, I have to have a team in place and I need to have a demo that's really solid and I can show a lot of gameplay on day one because no one's just going to say, here, Neil, because we love you so much and we love the trailer Crondor, here's that you know, one point, you know, one million dollar check that you need to make this happen. Um, so um, I want to make it happen. It is in my you know, in my horizon at some point, I hope, but uh, there are a lot of I's that have to get dots and a lot of T's that have to get, I's get dotted and T's get, uh, T's get uh, uh, before I can really kind of entertain that seriously. And uh, I, I've really appreciated all the great things that people have said. I've gotten so many letters. I mean, I kind of asked people kind of uh, a few months ago whether they would be interested to, to support something like that. And I got a lot of support from people that is great, it's fantastic, please do this. I, I will send you my, my you know, college tuition, just go do this. And uh, that's marvelous and fantastic. I, it makes me happy to know that, you know, all of these years later, there are all these people that still love that game, you know, uh, and I still get letters about it all the time. Uh, but I wanna make sure that when we do it, it happens. You know, uh, I'm, I'm not going to pull the trigger instead of said, yeah, we're going to do it. And whenever we do it, we're going to go. Uh, and so, uh, so anyway, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll have to wait on that one a while. Yeah, I love the puzzle chess in that game. So more specifically, my, me and my wife uh, loves the puzzles. Uh, so when I played that game, she loved it too, because I'd say, oh, you know, here's another puzzle chess. Come in here. <laughs> it was so funny because we found that that was exactly the pattern, is that the... Uh, the guys will be playing through and then they find a puddle, puzzle chest and, you know, the husband or the boyfriend or whatever would call and say, hey, honey, I found one of these puzzle chests. And she'd run in and then they would solve the puzzle chest together and then she'd leave. <laughs> um, and I just kind of love the fact that there was that, you know, interesting dynamic. He said, you know, back in the, at least in the day, you say there was kind of a there were the girl games and the boy games in terms of the way that they seem to be approached. Um, but uh, but yeah. Uh, People love those things. Now, I, I, I wish I could take take credit for those, but the puzzle chest, that, that the particular design was John Cutters, and that was his his concept. And uh, uh, again, he he, John was really good with puzzles. Puzzle, if anything was puzzle related, that was really John's uh, forte. Of course, you know he's at Big Fish Games, and that's what he does all the time now. It's all puzzles all day all along. So, um, um, and he's probably going 
to have some really cool stuff coming out, you know, some, some additional puzzle stuff coming out soon. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back either tomorrow or Wednesday with that bonus video. Now that's about an hour's chat with Neil about his Thief of Dreams Kickstarter. This is the novel based on the game uh, that he was planning and talked about in this video. So if you haven't seen that page, I'll post a link to it in the show notes. So please go check that out and make a donation. If uh, Especially if you had a pirated copy of uh, Betrayal at Carondor back in the day. This would be a great way to uh, repay Neil for all his hard work. And I think we're going to get a damn good novel out of it too. So really excited about that. And uh, as long as you're feeling generous and supportive, uh, please uh, take the time to go to armchairarcade.com, look for the Matt Chat link, and uh, make a donation or set up a subscription for this show. Really, really appreciate it, guys. Uh, obviously, these shows don't produce themselves. It takes a lot of time and hard work, and ale doesn't grow on trees. So thank you very much, very, very much for your contributions. Also wanted to mention again my book here. So here's my uh, new book. This is Honoring the Code, Conversations with Great Game Designers. It's based on some interviews I did uh, here on the show, uh, but as you recall, when I first started, I had to limit those to 10 minutes. So a lot of material got left out. It should, it's all here. Uh, so even if you watch the show religiously, uh, you'll still find plenty of uh, stuff in here that you haven't seen before from these uh, designers. A lot of uh, my favorites, uh, John Romero, uh, Rebecca Heinemann, uh, Becky Berger, uh, Chris Avalon, Brian Fargo, uh, and you know, and lots, lots more. Now, if you want a signed copy of this, what I can do, uh, I'll sell you the book for $40, I'll sign it, and then we'll calculate the shipping. Uh, so hopefully, if it won't be that much, a couple of the, I've, I've had one international order already for, to Portugal, and that was over 20 bucks for that. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't know how much it will cost to ship to you in your country. If you can find a cheaper way to, uh, for me to ship it, I'm you know, happy to work with you on that. But anyway, I really want you guys to have a copy of this if you, if you like the show. So just uh, email me um, or go to, you can use the contact button at Armchair Arcade and we'll set something up. Anyway, that's honoring the code. Okay. Now what about that ale of the week? Uh, my favorite part of the show. Uh, this week I've got a ale from the Stevens Point Brewery in uh, Stevens Point, Wisconsin. It's called Six Hop India Pale Ale. And according to the little write-up here, there's a lot of different malls and uh, hops in here. It's a quote-unquote delicious adventure. Uh, so we'll be uh, verifying that claim. It does have 8.5% alcohol, so they may not be far off with that. Uh, not a lot else here on the bottle, so uh, let's get it open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this six hop here in the rather excellent drinking horn. Ah, that just smells heavenly. You can smell a little bit of a hop of the hops in there, of course. Uh, which you'd expect from a pale ale, India pale ale, that is. You know, it's going to be, usually be slightly bitter, uh, but hopefully not bitter enough to taste bad. You know, just you know, a little bite, you know. Maybe a little uh, sort of chocolatey, little citrusy uh, kind of bouquet there, if you will. Uh, what can I say? I really like the smell of this. Uh, let's give it a taste, though. And that is... It's, it's kind of thick and creamy, and there's the, the hops there, a little bit of a, kind of a marshmallowy I tasted this. Uh, quite nice, uh, not, not pungent or uh, alcoholic tasting at all. A little bit, uh, maybe just a little bit uh, more bitter than I would like, but I gotta say overall this is uh, very nice, uh, quite drinkable. Not a real, not a really complex uh, flavor to this. Uh, when you taste it, you get the sort of hoppiness and a sort of slightly bitter taste in your mouth. Um, a little bit of a, I'd say more coffee-like than, than chocolate-like here. Uh, but overall, though, I really like this one. I'm going to go uh, four out of five drinking horns on this. I uh, highly recommend the Six Hop. I notice the same company has a, a couple of other flavors available, so I'll be uh, checking those out hopefully soon. All right, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And the quotation comes from, of course, Raymond E. Feist, and it goes something like this. Never underestimate the potential of human stupidity, especially when wealth and power are at stake.
See you guys next week. Okay, um, Thank you. I need the Lincoln hat and the stupid beard back. <laughs> you don't understand. I'm Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, right. Ha ha ha. Now, come on, Mr. Lincoln. And my beard, I am.